another yet another episode of Seat at the Table, I start laughing. This is just too much fun. Thank you all for pulling up a chair and having a seat at the table. I'm your host, Justin Shore, American firefighter and paramedic. I'm Jim Brazel, a new physician, former paramedic, actually current paramedic still. So There you go. Uh, Jeremiah Bush, paramedic intern. Welcome. Natalie Quimito, uh paramedic and preceptor. <laughs> Bill Sugiyama, I am the uh, Director of Emergency Medical Services for the City of Oakland Fire Department and the uh, President-Elect for the International Association of EMS Chiefs. Great, some exciting things happening there, there, Excellent. and there. Lots of stuff to talk about. No real formal topic per se, but what's new out there? What's going on in EMS? What's some of the stuff that's coming up around the pike? Not just from you guys on the field and, and even you, a brand new you know, paramedic intern, but at the Chiefs Association and also as a physician and a paramedic looking into things. What I want to start with is Natalie and Jeremiah, you guys are doing a show called Mutual Aid. Tell us about that. Well, um, I'm from Los Angeles. I've worked there my whole life um, as an EMT for almost four and a half years. And when it came time to find a field internship, I was having some trouble. So I turned over to my friend Natalie here and I said, you know, is there any way you can help me out with this? And she works 1,800 miles away in rural Louisiana which is not at all like Southern California. She talks to her boss and we get this plan worked out and I actually go to her system and start working as a paramedic in a very, very different system than I'm used to. And we turn it into a little web series. And it's, it's nearly over now, but it's been going quite well. Big learning experience, big uh, differences in just how to practice as far as what uh, field support you have, the hospital resources, a good comparison that I always like to say is that there's more hospitals in my county than there are in her state. Wow. And to leave a system where I had eight to ten choices of a hospital and all these different specialties and a, uh, you know, another engine or several police officers is just kind of a, a button away to somewhere where I have to respond for 25 minutes or 45 minutes and I have one hospital to choose from and no first responders. It's, uh, it's been a very sort of rounding experience and something I've enjoyed. So how's he doing? He's doing great. There's, there's a lot of difficulty at the beginning. Like, I've, I've talked about this before with people. I'm not used to having such a well-adapted paramedic student. I've had others that were, I needed to hold their hand. He came in and just blew me away. And so there was a lot of opposition, our, our, my preceptor style and his style of learning. And we just, maybe two shifts ago, were like, let's just be partners, you yeah. know? And it, it was difficult, but it's been a great experience. And we've had a blast. That's like, that's the main thing is we've had a lot of fun, so. Great, and that, how old are you? 23. Jared? 24. 23 and 24. You've been in EMS how long? Can't be more than six years, right? And this coming January will be five, so. Five years. I took my EMT class in 2007, so. Okay, so you guys are definitely the future of EMS. You're proactive. You're involved not only in your systems, but obviously others. And I'm looking at your shirt. It says Gen Med, and yes. that's... That's a podcast. That's a podcast, internet radio show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you guys talk about? Everything. Generational <laughs> issues, mostly. Um, it, it started back in December of this year, in 2009. Um, after I came out from Expo, they were just saying... I looked at all the podcasts and said, I want something geared toward my generation and the people dealing with the issues that I'm having. I, I listen to these things and it's, oh, this and that, these protocols, and I'm like, well, what about, how do they feel about the things I feel about? Tattoos and piercings and stuff that I still deal with. I had a nose piercing at the time and was just like, well, why can't I have that? Or should I have this? Because people give me a lot of grief about it. I went to some of my friends, one in Canada, Scott McLeod, one in Virginia, Mara Schuwager, and we said, all right, let's do something. And we came up with GenMed, and it's a podcast. And Jeremiah, later, after I met him at the Chronicles premiere in February, um, he came on board. And we just deal with a whole bunch of issues, and uh, it's a slow process, but it's fun. It's getting off the ground, and it's, it's great because when I first started, there really wasn't much out there. You had your textbook, and maybe a CD-ROM came with it. And that was, C that was as far as it goes. What? what? Yeah. I, I, something yeah. familiar for you, and then Sadie Ron. And there was maybe, there was Jamie Davis's show, The yeah. Medic Cast, and that was sort of it. Mm -hmm. And only in the last year and a half or so has um, EMS in social media and, and educational resources online really picked up. And so what GenMed is, is it takes 
not just the younger generation, but anyone that's new in medicine, a new or young provider, all through the process of, of thinking about a career in medicine to the first you know, three or four years in the field, and really focuses on their needs, and not just in EMS. We have a co-host who's in nursing school. Um, she was in charge of the physician track for a long time, and we really want to look at medicine as, as medicine. It's very mm -hmm. easy to fall back on EMS, but really we want nurses and respiratory therapists and physicians and medical assistants and show them options in careers and show them um, options in, in practice. And, you know, we're from all over North America, so there's, you know, there's obviously more opportunities than just in your own little world. One's mm -hmm. from Canada, I'm from California, you're from Louisiana, so I'm trying to, you know, fill that generational gap and provide a little entertainment and education too. Speaking of entertainment, you guys had a great concept for a show a little while ago that I know is going to go live probably before this show does. Where you guys, yeah. Where you guys have a time traveling ambulance. Yes. And you, you picked some people in the EMS social media circles. <laughs> and these guys actually, can I, can I tell them what yeah, it was? Go ahead. It was so much fun. They, they invited me to do it. What they did was they had a time traveling ambulance and they went back in time and interviewed someone in the, the social media EMS circles on a, a run very early in their career. And they bumped into me in rural New Mexico back in 1994, that was and so they had classic. a blast with it. <laughs> and I had a blast with it because it really reminded me about why I got into this field. And so what I wanted to do was start with you. If they got in their time traveling sure. ambulance and went back to one of the first calls you ever went on as a young EMT, tell us about it. I, you know, um, I remember being uh, uh, 19 years old and uh, uh, starting off in uh, Sacramento County and having this wonderful paramedic on uh, Mo Waller, she just retired. And uh, what I remember was is, is just this whole thing of being in the back of the ambulance and EMS, exciting. And at that time, EMS was very new, was just fledgling. And uh, what they did, basically for the private mom and pops to survive, as we know, is you basically it's quantity. Maybe a little bit of quality, but mainly quantity. So you had a limited amount of ambulances and you wanted a whole bunch of calls. So all I remember is within a 24-hour period is running 26 calls in 24 hours mm -hmm. and just moving and grooving and the adrenaline and everything that you get caught up in as a kid. I mean, you can see about this far in front of your face when you're 18 and you think this is exciting, this is amazing, this is what I want to do, and but you don't really see the 20-year length in the future as far as it goes. Mm -hmm. I knew as soon as uh, uh, my first day writing an EMS that this is something that I wanted to do. I didn't know how long it would last. I didn't know how long I'd be able to do the job. But uh, the first thing I felt was not only the excitement, but, but it was amazing that uh, you could go into somebody's life for five minutes and make a significant difference. You know, and that's the thing that really, really, the need, you know, because we all have, people in EMS, we all have this void that we need to fill. Mm -hmm. And this was filling that void for me in that sense, like, wow, I, I could help people in this little amount of time. I can help a lot of people. And so, at that young age, you're kind of idealistic, and you do really want, you have the hero mentality, yeah. and you want to be a hero, and that's exactly how it all started. And medicine was very exciting, because it was challenging, and uh, that's what kind of drew me in, you know? So if we had gone back to you with that partner on that day, you ran those 26 jobs, and I said, where do you see yourself in 10 years? What would your answer have been then? You know what, I was, I, was, I would look at it like this, like, oh yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna go to medical school or something, hmm. you know, that, that idea. I'm 18, I, I'm invincible, I'm gonna go to medical yeah. school, I'm gonna do this, I'll rule the world, you can't stop me. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, you know, I don't know any better type stuff. You know, it's one of those things, what do they say? At 18, you think you know everything. At 21, you realize you didn't know everything at 18, but you still think you know everything now. Mm -hmm. At 25, you kind of realize that you don't get it, and then when you reach 30, you say, screw it, I don't know a damn thing. And so, <laughs> the deal is, at that time frame, overall, I. At 18, I was invincible. Felt like, yeah, oh, this is this is just a stepping stone. I'm just going to do this ambulance jockey stuff for a while. Go to school, go to med school, and everything else. And and lo and behold, it just uh, it takes a hold of you, mm -hmm. you know. And it, it becomes your it, you realize you start uh, meeting nurses and physicians, and then you realize uh, you know you get a different drive and you evolve. You hopefully evolve, and that's where it's at. So if you were to see me, you'd see a wide-eyed, scared kid running calls, screaming in the back of the ambulance, pounding his hands and everything else on the roof, just hollering like crazy, getting to talk on a radio, you know, type stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, that was the fun part. You know, eating Taco Bell with your foot yeah. out the window, screaming down, going to a call, and you know, and that's what it was about. 
Jim, your early, earliest EMS memory? Where, where would the time traveling ambulance find you on your first run as an EMT? It would be 1989 in the spring. I don't even remember what month it was. The sun was shining. <laughs> no, it was dark out, actually. <laughs> Our ambulance station was in an apartment building, and the, the apartment next door um, was, it was, the ambulance company was in the front apartment building. The mortuary that I worked for was across the street. Mm -hmm. It was a mortuary-based mm -hmm. ambulance, oddly good way, enough. Good way to drum up business. Well, absolutely. The, the husband owned the ambulance, and the wife owned the mortuary. <laughs> I guess because you can't own a mortuary and an ambulance. So, <laughs> Conflict know, of interest. They took That's, care of that. Oh. <laughs> Is he still breathing? Yeah. Ground block. <laughs> yeah, keep driving. Yeah. Um, we were watching TV, and the big pound came on the door. You know, okay, what's going on? And the lady next door was having a seizure. And it was their sister pounding on the door and we walked in and of course there's a convalescent hospital across the street. And one of the fine young ladies that claimed to be a nurse there had put a spoon in the young lady's mouth. That she conveniently bit. So there was blood everywhere, it was wonderful. I was like, yeah, bloody call. And I proceeded to take the spoon out and remove the teeth that came out with it. And um, I can remember bagging the patient all the way down the street to the hospital. It was, it was like the rubber meets the road. Finally, I'm on my code three call. I've been waiting three days for this. It was like the third day of my ambulance career. And I was just... I mean, I, I still remember it today. There's nothing like that feeling. And if I could recapture that feeling someday, I, I would love to have it back. I did a little bit when I did medical school and got to do surgery for the first time. Mm -hmm. But that feeling goes away again. Sure. So that's that, 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 you know, this is why I'm doing it. It's the addiction of EMS. Are you looking for that feeling still? Absolutely. Every time you get in an ambulance, every time you get in a helicopter, you mm -hmm. look for that feeling. Mm -hmm. That's your, that's your quest. It's a drug. This business is a drug. Would, would you say that some of the burnout out there is folks looking for that and not finding it and getting frustrated? Probably. And I think a lot of the burnout has to do with the fact that they're never going to find it again. Mm -hmm. That they've, they've lost it and, and that they aren't, they aren't successful in finding it. And that's, that's the responsibility of their providers to educate them and, yeah. and keep them fresh and teach them all the new things they need to know to keep them fresh. Yeah. And that, that feeling will come back because you get to experience those first times again. Well, and you maybe you find to, excitement. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I say you had the fun excitement in patient mm -hmm. care, not just the crazy calls, but in the, the hand-holding and the, just getting to know some of these people that I pick up that are 90 and 80 years old and hearing their stories. And they were, they were alive way before I was even thought of. Mm -hmm. So, and just, just getting to know those people. I find so much... Um, joy out of that of talking to people and getting to know them and treating them that way and it's not always the bloody calls it's not the the cool things you can do it's not the intubation it's not the needle decompression it's mm -hmm. it's getting to know mom and pop it seems i really like, need to yeah. preface that call with the fact that we didn't carry gloves then <laughs> yeah. we wore white shirts and it was a badge of honor to have a blood, blood stain shirt. on it yeah, yeah. i think uh, you know I, I think Jim really hits point and, and, and all you do. Uh, one of the things in EMS that to prevent the burnout that we talk about and the things that, uh, you know, for, for your ability to go ahead and, and be long standing in this profession is, is that you have to know yourself. And the deal is, is this, we're always looking for that. You're right, that void. And I t we talked about, I mentioned the void, and we talk about that void, that need, that need for adrenaline, that need for, for, for a rush. And the deal is, if you do a personality profile on most people in EMS, what you'll find is, is, that, is that we're individuals that are very insecure, that we need the recognition, that we need to help others because we couldn't help ourselves at some time in our lives. You know, and then we take, we take these things that we do, the addiction that we have, and if we don't have EMS, what do we have? We have what? A hyper drug use, hypersexuality, you know, ADD. I mean, what is it? 90% plus of all those in EMS, long public safety like this, we all have ADD and we or have these OCD. difficulties. Or yeah. OCD, yeah. So the deal is, or is both. that, you know, <laughs> for, for many of us, and even for myself, to openly admit this to my for myself I mean EMS became a way to help to fill a damaged void that I had in my youth in that capacity and so until you get to know yourself and exactly know why you're here that burnout comes quickly it does in five years it's amazing because it's like 
It's like those that are addicted to heroin. You need more, more, and more, and more, and suddenly the more is not enough because you can never fill the void. It just never ends, you now, know? Would you say that this is where the industry